Good morning everyone, I'm Tina Nixon standing in for Michael Laws uh, and it's good to be back in Wellington after a vis busy family Christmas for us in the uh, tropical climes of Rangitumo uh, which saw a lot more rain than uh, we've normally had in the wider upper over a Christmas period so everything is lush and green and growing also means lots of fungus and stuff like that too so uh, always has its downsides we're hoping now we're going to get some sun over there uh, make everything grow uh, and of course it was pretty interesting sort of heading into the new year and uh, watching what was happening on the political scene uh, to find that Jacinda tendered her resignation when she did. Must admit well I was actually on a bit of a roadie with some girlfriends uh, just prior to that actually the week before it and uh, we discussed what would probably happen this year and we all thought that she would probably resign. Um, I, I, I thought basically because for the very reasons she outlined, which she would probably had no more left than the tank, it was pretty obvious before Christmas she was getting pretty buggered. And th that sort of indicated to me that if she didn't have the will she um, and she was faced with a bad poll, then if she was going to exit, it would be an exit, early exit. So, and that's in fact exactly what she um, she did. Um, I'm absolutely delighted, uh, despite the all of the talk around the traps about the possibility that some of the comments on social media and in the media uh, about Jacinda were one of the reasons that she has left the office. I don't think that was the case at all. Um, as I said, I think she was just buggered. Uh, and to be fair, I have a lot of girlfriends who and women friends, girlfriends, whatever you want to call them, who really don't like Jacinda and are really glad to see the back of her. And probably we haven't been that kind on social media sometimes. I don't think I've ever called her Cindy or anything like that, but I certainly have uh, gone to the heart of what I thought was her competency around not being able to manage a government. Good on the international stage, useless at home. Uh, and I've never resolved from that. Uh, and for that reason, I, I was really struck by an article I saw um, last uh, uh, last week, which was written by a a woman called Nadine Roberts, and um, on stuff. And it was about a, a a rural mental health campaigner and very very successful farmer and a rural leader. An on, uh, he's an entrepreneur, he's a raconteur, uh, and he's he's stood on the global stage and talked about our resilience uh, and, and, a, and a lot of how we can overcome some of the mental health issues, specifically in the rural regions. And uh, the problems worldwide are always pretty much the same. His name is Doug Avery. And I've watched him on social media and he's like a lot of people, he gets a bit bloody ranty every now and again and you think, oh yeah, fair enough. Um, and you think, well, like, like he does, uh, but maybe, maybe you don't use the same turn of phrase, but you know where he's coming from. And you think, well, hell, he's done a hell of a lot for people out in the community. So this morning, um, we've got Doug Avery on, on board with us. Uh, and Doug is, as I said, is, is a, an international uh, leader in uh, helping overcome mental health issues in the rural sector and a bloody good farmer to boot. He's got a good turn of phrase. And welcome this morning, Doug. Uh, Tina, thank you. That's a pretty uh, a glamorous introduction uh, for a <laughs> semi-retired old man uh, who's just been um, sort of hauled over the coals for um, possibly uh, overstepping the mark. But thank you for that. And it's very, very nice uh, to be here. Yeah, very well, nice. I, I must admit, Doug, I was a bit struck by the article because it just seemed to sort of single you out for one. Uh, it was very much, this is all about men being rude to women, which is the second bit. And the third bit, it was it was just like, um, we don't care about all of the other stuff you've done. You should give it all up now just because you, you were rude to the, uh, the Prime Minister. And it seemed to me just to be uh, a total element of unfairness around the whole thing. Uh, well, I, I guess if you live in a glass house, you uh, throw stones, and I, uh, I'm a stone thrower. I, uh, just listening to your sum up there, <coughs> I've been exactly the same. Uh, uh, when the uh, reporter from Stuff, um, Miss Roberts or Porter or uh, whatever her name is, uh, rung me, it was uh, it was the most unprofessional um, delivery I've ever had, and that's fine. 
that's absolutely fine. And she uh, she literally attacked me uh, from the view that I was a misogynistic old fool. <laughs> uh, but if you look at my social media uh, pages, most of the people who have responded, and I would point out at this stage, that I've had a bigger response uh, from this than anything else I have ever done. My phone, uh, I went straight to my Facebook page after that interview and put on that I was, I'm obviously going to get some treatment. And then I watched and waited, and it was a, probably about an hour before it came up, and I published that article myself and uh, deliberately because I wanted people to read and see what had been said. And 98% didn't agree with it. A lot of people who haven't had anything to do with me, Tina, uh, will be left. They're left floundering and thinking, well, what the hell is this guy? I've heard of him or whatever. But uh, a whole lot of different things came forward. Now, the first attack was uh, that I was misogynist and my dislike of uh, of the Ardern government is policy-based, uh, but I would be the first to admit... Yeah, I want you to that repeat that, Doug, because I think that's really, really important, that your criticism uh, has my, always my, been very my, much based on... Uh, their policies, not the people. No, you know, I'm not saying you haven't said something rude about them, but that's, you know, um, that's that's par for the course. But in reality, all of your stuff is based on their crappy policies. Uh, they, because they directly affect the people that I, uh, my, what I call them my people, rural people, uh, they directly affect them. So if you go back through time, I sort of got involved in national uh, politics and and associated things back in Jim's day. And I've worked through with an awful lot of agricultural ministers. I've done a lot of work for the government internationally, uh, representing us at greenhouse gas summits and all that sort of stuff. The world farmers in Zambia, been all over the, all over the trap. And it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that uh, I was on a first name basis and and very close to all the agricultural ministers and I knew Damien O'Connor and I've known Damien for years uh, and initially in this uh, process I tried to make suggestions and, and work with him but then I realised I was wasting my time so I didn't. But the day that Jim Anderson, who was probably the agricultural minister that I got closest to, mm. I was very close to David Carter as well he invited me up to the um, speaker's lounge one day and I didn't go and I regret that for the rest of my life. But the day Jim Anderson did his valedictory speech in Wellington, he did a speech in um, Te Papa in the morning uh, where he described me as the Rutherford of, of agriculture. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that, that was way over the bloody top. But he was a good bugger. He's a good bugger, Jim. To... I mean, I had a lot to do with him too. I I, I worked for him for a bit. Um, he was the minister um, at the time, and and um, I did a couple of campaigns um, with him in terms of you know just different policy stuff. He yeah. was a good, decent, honest yeah, and, and man. And the thing about Jim, the thing about Jim was that he um, he approached things from uh, investigating uh, how do you how do you operate why, why are you looking and thinking this way mm. and then forming an opinion from that rather than forced down from central Wellington this is what you'll do and yep. so you know we had 18 years with Clark and English where and I had a lot of time especially in the first six years for Helen Clark uh, where policy was handled in a way where it was put out and people could have a real participation in that process. Mm. And as this administration has gone on, and uh, I, I tried to, uh, to to point this out to Porter, or, um, to yep. Nardine, I'll use that word. Yep. I tried to point that out, but she, she was by then on asking me continuously, and I pushed the speaker button so my wife could listen in, and she was highly amused. So, in terms uh, of the she, interview, was it was was she was she asking you basically to give up some of your awards because you'd slighted the yep. prime minister? She 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 focused on um, on my uh, uh, um, uh, the award for. Um, uh, Agricultural Speaker of the Year. Yep. Why did you accept that? Why did you accept that? I don't, <laughs> she, at several points, she said I didn't answer. I didn't get a chance. 
Gosh. I, I wouldn't have taken. I wouldn't have taken the call. It was the most unprofessional uh, mincing that I've ever had. And, and you know, when she when she finally went, I thought, well, you know, this isn't going to be good. I can tell that. Yeah. And uh, and I, I got a lot of response. I've had. It's been a very interesting process, and also a big learning curve for me as well. Tina, in the last four, uh, three years, we've all lived in a cave, really, haven't we? And oh, mm. me included, I, I was used to a completely different life, and I've been quite happy with the life that developed, but it's cave-like. And... Yeah. Uh, one and of the you and, and, and yeah, look, you're, you're pretty. You're, you're very prominent on social media, uh, and oh, I, I mean, you've been linked yeah. to my page for a long time. And so I've kept an eye on on the stuff that you've done. That's why I thought the article was so bloody unfair. Uh, so uh, just in terms of um, of that, you did make some comments that um, could be seen by some people to be misogynist, calling her Auntie Cindy or Cindy or whatever it was. Um, and yet the, I find it really incredible that in the last few days since she she vacated the seat and Chippy's taken over, we're calling him Chippy. I mean, Chippy, spear me. So we've got a Prime Minister called Chippy and everyone's happy to call him bloody Chippy, but we're not allowed to call Jacinda Cindy because she doesn't like it, Okay. So you know, uh, there's a there's a double standard here, and I can't understand the focus just on men who dislike Jacinda when there's a lot of women who dislike Jacinda as well, and we've been pretty pretty strident around our calls, like you trying to play it around what she does and her abilities rather than her personality, if that makes sense. I think I think if I you know to be fair to uh, Nadine Porter. I, I'm going to adjust myself quite, quite, quite largely. Like in the article, I said I was going to step up, and I will. I will be focusing a lot more uh, in the next period of time on the failed policies. And I recognise that uh, she's given me a wake up call that I, I was off the ball. And so, to that extent, do you really I'm, think uh, you I'm, were though? I mean, I, I think uh, you're folding only, when you should be. Only a little be. bit. So. No, she she put in there that I called uh, I called her a beehive Barbie. I'm, I'm, even, I'm not even familiar with the term. I've never used that term. And she's course, using somebody... she, she's also using a technique which I find really reprehensible, and I've been the subject of this too. Is that if you are if something comes on your page or you're on another page and you like something, like doesn't necessarily mean like. It means you've read it and. Um, you've had a reaction to it. And if you don't know emojis or whatever, then you can do a like. And if you haven't haven't got a good grasp of emojis, it could have been a thumbs down, thumbs up, sad face, happy face, whatever. But suddenly our whole communication and, and people's assessment of what we're thinking is based on a like, which is not actually a like. So you've probably liked it, but you wouldn't have necessarily liked it, if you get my meaning. Um, oh, yes and no. I, I mean, I believe that I, uh, every day when I get up, I've got a little mantra that I, I try to be a better person. And I, f I feel that my life in that cave uh, over the last few, few years, I've lost uh, sight of, of what I really am. And so what that process has done, uh, the feedback that I've had, and it's come from far and wide, and it's 98% positive as it's come to me. I've had a few yeah. people get in touch with me and give me a carry up and, and, and I expected that. But I, I'd forgotten. So I said to her that I didn't see myself as a as a as a leader or much of a leader or whatever and, and she she just uh, hooked it to me about that. And, and what I realise now is a lot more people have been watching and uh, following me than I than I than I'd thought and that sort of uh, made me realise, oh yeah, the life in the cave wasn't as lonely as I thought. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I, I so you're saying basically that you've actually taken a, a little bit of what she said and and said fair enough. I need to tone it down a bit, um, but oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to play harder on the policy front. Oh, ab absolutely, and 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 that is my bad. That is my bad. And you know, if you if you have a profile uh, and you do bad, you get uh, you get. The, well, you see, the here's the here's the rub, Doug. I'm a I'm a strident woman, and I've uh, I, I don't know whether I've ever called Jacinda Cindy or whatever, but it doesn't make any difference to me, and I don't think that is the greatest sin in life 
is, uh, is, to, is to make sorry. a derogatory comment around somebody, and, and, and it's not like you call, you, you know, you could call her a whole host of names. It would have been way worse than that. This is like at the very lightest end of social media attacks. It's not even an attack. I mean, it's a belittlement of anything. And so it's right at that right end. Um, and, and, and so I just don't understand why you think you need to pull back that much because actually it's, in the scheme of things, it's just a, it's a non-event. If you're looking at it from a crime perspective, you, would get, you wouldn't even get diversion. You wouldn't even, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be convicted. There would be nothing. It would just, you might even get a kick up the pants and that's about it. It's not that well, big. I, I, think, I think the main thing from my point of view is, uh, in a way, it's uh, revitalised the old old lion. I, I um, I've been so encouraged, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about about some of the feedback I've had. Uh, I, I, I've been stunned, and and it's massive. And some of the uh, things have been put on on my Facebook page and other other places. Uh, and it's just outwardly stated, and a lot of it's come directly to me because the work that I've been pretty heavily engaged in in the last few years. And, and she, I see that she referred to the uh, the dark side of Doug Avery. And, and actually, that's quite a good statement for me because a lot of the work I do is in the dark, with the dark people, uh, in the night, at times when everyone else is asleep. And, um, and that's a good point. So point. Just to pause there too, Doug, because I think there'll be a lot of our listeners who won't understand that you not only get on the stage and talk about um, mental health and resilience, you actually get on the phone and talk to people who are going through it right at the time. Uh, wh one night, uh, it was in, I think it was January 2018, and the phone went at half past two. And I looked and I thought, half past two, what the hell? Oh, hell, it'll be something with mum. And then I thought, no, mum died a month ago. Um, it's, oh, I wonder what it is. And I picked up the phone and it was a guy who was in the secure unit of uh, Invercargill Hospital and he still had his phone with him, which I find quite extraordinary. And he'd just Googled uh, one of the substances that was in his medication. And he said, Doug, I'm just ringing to see that I've got the right number. What would be the earliest I could ring you in the morning? And I'm thinking, stuff it. You've worked to me right up <laughs> And he said, I've just Googled uh, the substance that's in my medication and they're trying to kill me here. And I said to him, brother, settle down. No one will be trying to do that, but you can ring me as early as you like, but I'm wide awake now and we can carry on this conversation. He said, no, I won't keep, I won't keep you up. He said, I'll rig you at half past seven in the morning. And he did. And I rang that fella every day, uh, or he rang me, for about the next 10 days. And by the time we were finished, he was a farmer that had been admitted. And by the time we're finished, we're discussing um, the uh, kilograms of dry matter that you could get off a Lucian <laughs> paddock in a prop year. And I, I, on another example, uh, we always have, we, we normally have about a thousand visitors to Bonnevere every year. That's all dropped off with COVID, of course. Uh, one of the groups that comes to Bonnevere every year to live and learn is the, um, the diploma students. And one day they were just all getting on the bus to go and a young girl came over and flung her arms around my neck and she said to me, Mr Avery, you've given me the purpose to live. And I didn't see that coming and I just went full. And I said to her, here, take my card. I can't talk to you anymore now, but when you get back, you ring me and we'll have a talk. And we did, and I, I, I talked regularly with her for a couple of months, and I felt quite confident that she was on the road to recovery. Mm. And then one day, I, I was uh, just at home, and the phone went, and it was her. And she'd been to student health and told them that she felt suicidal. I said, well, we can have an appointment next Thursday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and she went straight to, to the card that I'd given her and <laughs> rang me and said, Doug, I, I, can't, I can't do this. And so while I kept her talking on the phone and just quietly found out where she was, uh, Wendy, my wife, worked frantically in the background communicating with uh, staff down there that we knew that would respond to a red alert like this, and it worked. And that young girl is now the mother of two children and living a very successful life. And so, you know, those are two... The other thing, I, there was two things that blew me away about the response for that article. When I work with people, often, often, 
as soon as they start feeling great, they just disappear. Uh, they don't often even say, gee, thanks for all your time. I never charge because I'm not professionally qualified. I've just always done that side of things off the bat, the bat of my own bat. Mm. Uh, I charge for, for my professional speaking because I'm good at it. Yep. And that has always covered uh, the cost and offset that cost. Uh, when that article was produced, I had the biggest connection with a whole lot of people that I'd forgotten about. They saw that potentially I was on the ropes and they rung up and they said, oh, they rung up or they text me or they emailed me or whatever. Well, I'm bloody glad to hear that because I think that's, that, 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 that actually speaks to who you really are. And it doesn't speak to the, the little pimple that you, you've had on, you know, had on your character or the wee stain on your character, if you want to say that. And to be fair, as I, I'll keep repeating this, Doug, I think it's such an, a minor thing that you've said um, that it's not even worth that article. Simply is not worth well, that article, and I get the point yeah. that it's made you think about what you're saying, and I understand that. And you've had a reflection, and you've thought, oh well, maybe it might be, might not be the right thing, and it's not the best of me. And I get that, but I, I just real, really struggle with a media that it actually could make a story out of that, make a story out of flippant comments on social media that mean bugger all. When why wouldn't they have looked at all of your um, your comments around rural policy, of which you're an expert on, because you turned a farm into that was pretty much not hellishly great into an amazing farm, and, and and so why wouldn't they focus on? that part of Doug Avery. It was a bit like when I interviewed Bryce um, from Groundswell and found out that he was the chair of his local bloody river committee down at the Pomahaka River, and which we were my, my people come from in Southland. And and here he is, and they, they did the 0800 Dobber farmer in if they were doing the bloody winter grazing stuff wrong and all of that. So here's the other side of Bryce. Here's the real story. Here is a farmer who does care about his environment. But what's the focus on? So, the focus is on old white men who, if they have one little tongue slip, are lambasted and put out in a paddock so everyone can chuck kinners at them. It's crazy. So it's kind of interesting that you brought Bryce up because I know him really well and I've known him a long time before he knew me. Uh, Jim Anderson introduced the Sustainable Farming Fund and after the uh, Bonavere and the uh, Starborough Flaxman Soil Conservation Group was based on our farm and two others, and it was seen when the first thousand uh, funded projects went through as one of the best uh, outcomes. And in the interim stage of that, I became a panellist for the government of the day. Uh, I think I was uh, there when um, Helen Clark was there, and I was there probably when John Key was there, did about five years of it, sorting through. And one of the, every project that I was involved in supporting funding that went through, I always made it part of my own business to keep an eye on what happened. Mm. And I remember the Puma Harker applying, and I can't remember the exact amount of money, and the, the chairman was Bryce McKenzie, and I followed it right through. And uh, I saw that as a pinnacle of excellence in that area. Yeah, exactly. So then I, then I saw McKenzie getting the same old treatment. Uh, you know, he organised the howl of all, uh, the mother of all protests. Yep. And it sure as hell was. And to me, Wellington took no notice of that at all. And so people have to understand if you don't listen, when concern is raised, and I went to that protest that day with a, a signage on my truck uh, saying, uh, farmers, we care, kiss a farmer and all that sort of stuff, a bit of Kerry Woodham going in there, not even further. And, um, and Bryce McKenzie, to me, is an, a classic example of the extreme efforts because the Plumahaka was a filthy river and it's now one oh, of the yeah. cleanest in South. It was terrible. And, and you see, so why not? And, and I, I've been privileged as an individual to visit mm. the best of agriculture in New Zealand, Australia, the UK, South America. I've been all over the place. I've yep. been 
I've had the most extraordinary experience. And one of the things that I know for sure is when I come back to New Zealand, we are the best. Yep, and I must admit, living in the wider upper and coming from Southland, you know, especially the the wider upper has just so many young, vibrant, amazing, forward thinking, risk taking, just world leading farmers who are doing amazing stuff every day. You well, hear about yeah. them and see and hear them, and and it's a privilege to stand alongside them uh, and support them wherever we can because that's that's what we should be doing, not lambasting them uh, and. And that brings us on to another point. I noticed this, one of the things I said to my partner the other day, I think I told you he's the Federated Farmers President in Wairarapa, and I said to him the other day, I said, look, this, all of this, this government looks like it's going to back down on bloody five or six different things. Where are you guys at on getting in the door and going, hang on, what are you going to do about Haywaki Ekanoa now? Because it's a bit of a shitstorm too. So can't we actually do something here? And where where are you? You know, where are all of the, all of the farming bodies going to Chippy and saying, hey, come on, you want to have a have a bit of a squiz at, at Three Waters. How about have another look at um, Hawaki Kanoa and seeing if we can come to some better arrangement than currently is. And where do you stand on Hawaki Ekanoa? Uh, well, yeah, like I, I, I was initially just sidelined, but then I started to realise, oh, this is this has really got a, a, a great opportunity to flourish. And I'm a I'm a fan of lighthouse leadership. So lighthouse leadership is. Uh, and it was definitely the way the Stabra Flaxman uh, Soil Conservation Group was run. Uh, it was, let's get beside these guys and help them uh, work through it and have everybody on the in the room on the same page. So that was one of the biggest days that damned the Ardern administration for me. Yeah, me when too. When she went to Featherston, yep. uh, it was one of the most disgusting stage-managed processes I've ever seen. Yep. Uh, she got up there and said, with a big smile on her face, I'm so pleased to be here today, uh, something to this effect. Uh, and we've been able to meet all the farmers' uh, requirements except for two things. Uh, first one, uh, we won't be able to acknowledge uh, uh, previous carbon sequestration. Well, if you take a farm like uh, we run in <laughs> eastern Marlborough, yeah, over the previous uh, 15 to 20 years... We'd moved our farm from a failed business to, in the words of Dr. Derek Moot, the lowest emissions intensity meat production system in the world. Yeah. So he rated, he rated no one else that he knew of in the world above us in producing clean meat. And that property on everybody's score, not including that work that we've done, will be carbon zero next year. A guy like Matt and Lily Wyeth, carbon zero already. Yep. There's lots of farmers out there that are already carbon zero, so that meat is clean. So yep. that day, she stood there and smiled at everyone and made it look as though we've given them everything and and if they don't accept this, well, the, the other thing she didn't, uh, we, will, we will set the price. Well, that is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> any government from now to decide at any time if there's going to be any farming con conducted in this country or not. And yeah. I, if anybody, if any farming levy body or that accepts that, they'll be uh, out of the job. Yeah. Uh, but it was good to, to hear Sam McIver on. The, um, I, I did hear another um, media outlet um, interview him this morning. And he's, he's definitely saying, let's get back to the table and have a rethink. Uh, so I think there is oh, may so maybe I time. So, Tina, if I can, I'd just love to read out to your listeners uh, some of the small print that was in the documentation that Jacinda uh, mentioned that day. And, and the last one, which I'll get to, uh, was the one that absolutely chilled me as the mental health guy. A significant change in spending across rural communities. Reduction in jobs or hours worked. Further depopulation and accompanying decline in rural service. Yep. Reduction in the quality of living. This is something that she was wanting us to sign up to. A reduction in the quality of our living. Unbelievable stuff. Mm. Incre and this is the one that really turned my blood sour. Increasing stress and mental health issues. Yep. So I'm the guy that spent probably thousands of hours unpaid, working with broken people. A lot of the comments that came to my face were from women. Some of those women were... 
are women whose husbands were on the point of collapse, and my wife has had to live with a man that went through that. Yep. I'll never forget going to a town one day and I got a text from this lady. She said, please, Doug, if you're going past the gate, could I talk? Could you call in? You're going to be going right past. Could you just call in for a cup of coffee? And I did. And she said, I want to tell you a story. She said, I bought your my husband because he was suffering depression. And I gave it to him for Father's Day and I put it in his plate. And he said, thanks for the present. Open. And he said, what the hell's that? And cast. And she said, every day when I set the table, I put the book at his place and she said I came in one day and I couldn't find him and I went looking for him and I went up to our bedroom and he was lying on the bed reading your book and he said to me this book's about me isn't it and she said it is he said I can't believe what I'm learning yeah six months after that that young man who'd been stressed to hell with various aspects of what was going on in this big dairy farm, uh, was in the, in the mental and, and stable condition to get out and buy a big runoff block and step forward. And I got hundred, I could tell you stories for, for 10 hours yeah. like that. And, and I, I think that's, the, that's, it, that's it, Doug. And I mean, in terms of, if I was the news editor at, the, at, at uh, and which I have been in the past, of a news organisation that let a journalist write a story like that, it would have been spiked. It would have never seen the light of day because it, 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 it dealt on a matter that was trivial and it, was, it wasn't it was like what you had done was at the worst end of the spectrum. It was a flippant comment. Um, it just did not in any way uh, deserve the gravitas of an article like that. It was... It was it was a character assassination and what the ultimate aim, from my perspective as a reader, that that story looked to generate was you to hand back some of your awards or say sorry. And I don't think you need to do either of those things. We are lucky in this country to have people like you who get out there and help the people who need help when they need it the most. Because our system's broken and doesn't always help as much as they could. So I uh, thank you I and I applaud, I, I, applaud what you, I applaud what you do out there for our rural community. And um, on behalf of the rural community uh, that I live in, I'd like to say thank you very much for all of the work that you've done because I know, like the woman that asked you to stop and have a coffee with them, I've known people who have read your book and it has changed lives. That's to me, would be the basis of a good story, not a flippant comment on social media. So stand tall, Doug. Don't think that this was anything uh, of note uh, in terms of who you are, because it's not. Uh, it's the absolute opposite. Um, so, look, I thank you very much for your time this morning. We could have talked for at least another hour, I think, um, on a whole range of issues because you can canvas so many. You can talk about policy. You can talk about farming and, and how you can change systems on farms and what the future of farming is. And you can talk about mental health. And there are not many people out there who can hit all of those buttons. So, thank well, you again. That's and very embellishing. That's very embellishing, Tina, and one of the most important things, that, if I could have a say on that, mental health, physical health, uh, the work we do, are all uh, connected in, in the core, and uh, that's why I know, I, I gave up worrying about talking about dry land pastures and stuff like that, much to the disgust of some of the people <laughs> who pushed there, because I know that if you haven't got strong mental health, you've got no health at all. Yeah, exactly, and we're going to leave that there, Dave. Hey, look, you have a great Thank day. Thank you very much and for having we me def on. We definitely, yeah, well, I, I float in and out of um, the, the platform team um, from time to time, and I do like to have a rural focus on things because that's where my heart is, that and fishing, um, and, and, and conservation. So those are my big buzz points, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to speaking um, with you uh, in the future, and if you bite your tongue a couple of times, so what? Doug, um, in relation to what you say on social media, keep up the good work, keep up the good fight, and uh, he is hoping that we may get some interim policy changes from the new Prime Minister um, and um, that'll give farmers 
a, a, a feeling of hope because it's very, very clear out there that there is still a lack of resilience among the rural community in respect of the changes that are coming at them. So you have a good day, Doug, and um, we'll talk, I would say, in the next few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you very much.